Welcome back, students. We now reach the culmination of physical chemistry, determining the mechanisms by which chemical reactions occur. We'll begin today by covering the basics of chemical kinetics. Uh, then we'll investigate some simple but generally applicable reaction mechanisms before exploring some more advanced mechanisms in the final lectures of the semester. This first discussion will come out of transport phenomena. In the transport phenomena we've been talking about, the physical properties of the system evolve with time to reach equilibrium. Chemical reactions are similar in that they evolve towards equilibrium, but they involve conversion between reactants and products, and we're going to discuss how that happens today. Today we'll discuss general chemical kinetics, and integrated rate laws that allow us to determine what happens to the reactants and products in a reaction with respect to time. The learning goals for today are going to be to define these different rate equations uh, and relate them to come up with the integrated rate laws. We're going to want to be able to distinguish between balanced chemical reactions like we're used to dealing with, and then what goes on in a reaction mechanism and the different elementary reaction steps that build up that mechanism. And then we're at the end, we're going to figure out how to construct rate laws for various chemical processes and actually determine um, how experimentally these processes are linked to different chemical reactions. In kinetics, we are concerned with the rates and mechanisms by which chemical reactions occur. We are far more familiar in our chemical experience and our background and all the other classes we've taken working with thermodynamics. Thermodynamics informs us if a reaction will occur given enough time and also the relative proportions between reactants and products. However, it tells us nothing about how likely a chemical reaction is to happen or how the reaction and products actually come together. Consider ATP. We all know from biochemistry classes that ATP releases free energy upon its hydrolysis, meaning that the products, uh, which is ADP and inorganic phosphate, are actually favored over the reactants, ATP and water. However, the non-enzymatic hydrolysis of ATP is quite slow because ATP is a kinetically stable molecule. It takes what we call activation energy to actually overcome the kinetic barriers preventing ATP from spontaneously hydrolyzing. This allows us and other living organisms to actually store ATP and control how it's used only in enzymatic processes to actually break down that free energy and use it in a way that enables us to live. Um, other reactions go by the same sort of mechanism. A common example is combustion, uh, but there's a variety of me mechanisms and reactions where the reactants are kinetically stable and actually need quite a deal of energy to overcome. We study this with kinetics. As a chemical reaction proceeds, the concentration of reactants decreases while the concentration of products increases. Today we're going to focus on basic reaction schemes and some simple mechanisms. In practice, monitoring reaction kinetics is quite challenging and requires an intricate knowledge of the reaction at hand. So for this simple process where we have A going to B, we can see that A is going down and B is going up. Uh, you'll note that there's a lot of problems with this compared to real chemical reactions. Uh, for example, we get 100% conversion of A into B. So A goes to zero and B goes to one. There's also no stoichiometry going on here, which is the conversion of one reactant to another. In reality, these mechanisms are much more complicated and we'll look at some of these today and then continuing on into the future. Consider this arbitrary chemical reaction shown here. The question we want to address is how do the concentrations of reactants and products change over time? We can determine this by using a simple ice table. So if we consider reactant A, we are going to start the reaction with some moles of reactant A. As the reaction goes forward, we are going to lose A to the extent of our lowercase a, our stoichiometric coefficient, times however many times the reaction went forward. If I did the reaction once, I would lose a numbers of our uh, molecule A. If I did it twice, I would lose 2A, 3 times 3A, 
and so forth. So we need a variable that discusses how many times the reaction has gone forward. And to be consistent with the book, I'm going to use the Greek uh, kasi, which is, I think, the hardest uh, Greek symbol to draw. If we want to figure out what happens to any chemical, we can see what's going on here. So we have the number of moles of A, and that's going to be equal to the initial number of moles of A, uh, in this case, minus A times the extent of the reaction C. If we wanted to do B, it would be NB is equal to the initial number of moles of B minus B times C, and we can do the same thing for C and D. Here, C and D are being produced, so we need to add in C moles uh, times the extent of our reaction or D moles times the extent uh, of our reaction since they're being produced. And this gives us one of the challenges with determining reactions is that, in general, the rate of consumption and production of reactants and products is uneven. Um, we can put all of this together to, to make just a general equation here. So the change in the number of moles of species I is equal to the initial number of moles of species I plus nu I, where nu I is the stoichiometric coefficient, so it would be minus A minus B plus C plus D in this case, times the extent of the reaction. We can determine what happens over time by simply taking the time derivative of this reaction. So the change in the number of moles of species I with respect to time is equal to the time derivative of this side of the equation over here. Um, the initial number of moles is constant, our stoichiometric coefficient is constant. So that means all we have, uh, if it's changing with time, is the extent of the reaction. So the number of moles of substance I changes with respect to time based on the change in the extent of my reaction with respect to time. I can define this here as the rate. So the rate of my reaction is equal to the change in the extent of the reaction with respect to time. Um, and that is simply equal to one over the stoichiometric coefficient of my substance I times d n i d t. So I can measure the change in the concentration of my reactant or product with respect to time. And from that, I can get a general rate of the reaction. And so again, I'll say this is that the actual rate of consumption or production of reactants and products is not necessarily the same as the extent of reaction due to stoichiometric coefficients. So to do an example, we can look at a chemical reaction, uh, the one shown here. So we could have four molecules of nitrogen dioxide reacting with a single molecule of oxygen to produce two molecules of N2O5. So in this reaction, the rate of the reaction would be equal to uh, either negative one fourth times the rate of change of the number of moles of NO2 with respect to time. It would also be equal to the negative rate of the consumption of oxygen with respect to time, or it could be equal to positive one half times the change in N2O5 with respect to time. And it, we could pick any one of these three uh, reactants or products to measure. In practice, like I mentioned earlier, this takes intricate knowledge of the reaction at hand to decide which one is easiest. Um, and this is actually the hardest part of determining the reaction rate is figuring out how can I actually monitor the consumption or production of products with respect to time. In a reaction like this, if this was the only possible reaction that was happening, something like the pressure would probably be used. As the reaction continues, we go from five moles of gas to two moles, so the pressure would decrease and you could use the loss of pressure in some way to actually determine the rate of the reaction. That's probably how this one would be measured. At this point, the rate is an extensive property. Uh, we define extensive properties at the beginning of the semester, and this means it will change if the number of moles changes. You can see here we're talking about the rate in change of the number of moles. So if I were to change the number of moles of NO2, I would change the rate of the reaction. Uh, this is in general not desirable, 
And we can change the extensive property that depends on the number of moles of the system to an intensive property that doesn't simply by dividing by the volume. So we define the rate as an intensive property and we just use the letter R there to define that by dividing the rate by the volume. So what this gives us is one over the volume times our, uh, what our rate is, which is one over the stoichiometric coefficient times the change in the number of moles with respect to time. We can bring the one over the volume into the number of moles. And what that gives us is the change in the number of moles per volume, which is simply the change in concentration. So the rate as an intensive property is equal to one over the stoichiometric coefficient times the change in the concentration of substance I with respect to time. Uh, and since here we're talking about a concentration, adding more moles would also change the size of the system and it wouldn't uh, actually change the rate if we were to change the concentration of substance I. Um, I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again here to be extra clear. Note the sign conventions that we use. So nu is the stoichiometric coefficient. It's negative for reactants and positive for products. And this reflects the, the differences in rate. So if we're talking about a rate of a chemical reaction, we're typically thinking about making products. Um, so what happens to the reactants as a chemical reaction goes forward? Well, they go down. So to make the rate positive, uh, as di dt is negative, as the, as the concentration of i decreases with respect to time, we multiply that by a negative constant to ensure the rate is positive. For most reactions, we can define a rate law that relates the concentration of reactants to the rate of the reaction. And it will do that as follows. So we'll say that the rate of the reaction is equal to K, the rate constant, times the concentration of reactant A raised to the alpha, times the concentration of reactant B raised to the beta, and we keep going on for as many reactants as needed to describe the reaction. The rate of the reaction is also impacted by things like pressure, temperature, activation energy, the diffusion rate of the particles themselves, uh, and so on. These are all taken into account into the rate constant K, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next lecture. Uh, the rest of this uh, equation here talks about how the concentration of reactants affect the rate. The alpha and beta here are talking about the order of the reaction. It's important to know, and this can't be emphasized enough, that the reaction order is not determined by the stoichiometric coefficients. The reaction order must be determined experimentally for every reaction. They're dependent on the mechanism of the reaction, not the balanced stoichiometry of the overall reaction. So for this reaction uh, above, it has been experimentally determined that the rate law is equal to K, the rate constant, times the concentration of NO2 squared times the concentration of O2. So you can see that this has no bearing on the actual stoichiometric coefficients. Um, and we'll see in a little bit that what this has to do with is actually the rate limiting step of the overall reaction and how many molecules are involved. Uh, this is in general pretty complicated to describe um, and it takes really good knowledge of the particular chemical reaction. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how this is done in general, but we won't do anything in practice uh, since it takes, again, a lot of time and commitment to a reaction to identify this. The next thing we wanna be able to do is try to measure reaction rates. So let's, consider a reaction. And for this whole section, we'll be doing a lot of arbitrary reactions just because it's easier. So we can consider a reaction where we have reactant A being converted to product B. And there's a rate associated with this reaction. We can denote that with a lowercase k here. Suppose this is a first order reaction, which means it depends on only one molecule of A. Um, and note that even though there's only one molecule of A here, we cannot assume that this is a first order reaction. This could be a second order reaction where two molecules of A need to collide with each other to give one molecule of A enough to convert itself into B. So again, there's no correlation between balanced chemical reactions and the rate order of the reaction. So we're gonna suppose this is a first order reaction. 
So I'll write that down here. It's first order uh, with respect to A. And we can define the rate then, the rate of this reaction is gonna be equal to the negative change of reactant A with respect to time. And we could maybe say we experimentally determined the rate uh, and the rate of this reaction, so K was equal to 40 per second. So you can say the rate of this reaction is gonna be 40 per second uh, times the concentration of A. The overall rates of reactions are always in units of molar per second. Um, so that means that depending on the rate law, the units of the rate constant change. For this first order reaction, the concentration of A is molar, so the units of the rate constant K need to be per second. If we go up here to our third order reaction, again, the units of rate are always per mol or molar per second. Here we have one molar and here we have molar squared. So in order to get molar per second, the units of the rate uh, constant in this case needs to be uh, per molar squared per second and multiplying that out will give us molar per second. So in this reaction, we have the rate is equal to 40 times the concentration of A. Well, what's going to happen to this reaction? In this reaction, the concentration of A goes down. And that's what it means to have a chemical reaction. We consume A and make B. So the concentration of our A will start high and then it will drop down to a lower value. What does that do to the rate? Well, the rate is dependent on the concentration of A. So as the concentration of A decreases, um, the reaction will get slower. How do we talk about reactions then? You'll be familiar with this from discussing michaelis menten kinetics. Um, and what we do with this is just say, well, we can't really talk about the overall rate because the rate changes as a function of time. So we're just gonna pick the starting rate. Um, and this is called uh, the method of initial rates. We just start with whatever the initial rate is. So the slope at the beginning of this process and say, that is the rate of this reaction. Of course, as the reaction goes on, the rate will actually slow down. So the slope here changes, the rate changes. But if we compare the initial rates and we always compare the initial rates, we'll be sure we're actually talking about uh, the same thing comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. In terms of actually doing this for a complex reaction, it is of course challenging. So many reactions are not going to be unimolecular like this one here. So if we only have one reactant A, all we have to do is watch as A goes away and we can figure out uh, by fitting this curve to one of our rate laws that we'll look at in the next section, what the order of the reaction is. But what if we have multiple reactants like in lab six, what do we do? There are actually two ways to go about this. Um, the first one is called the isolation method. So consider a different arbitrary reaction where here we have two reactants. A plus B and they're making C with some rate. Um, in this case, the rate law is going to be K and it's probably gonna depend on the concentration of A to some extent and the concentration of B to some extent. How can we isolate these things? In any given experiment, the rate depends both on the concentration of A and the concentration of B. Well, the first method is called the isolation method. And the isolation method will isolate one of the reactants um, by itself. So how do we do that? Well, consider this reaction. Now, if we had one molar A and maybe 0 0.01 molar B, what's going to happen to this reaction? So if we start with one molar A, and 0 0.001 molar B and no C, this reaction will go forward and it will make C. And the most we could actually make this reaction go forward is 0 0.001. So we could lose 0 0.001 and make 0 0.001 C. And then at equilibrium, we'd have approximately 0 0.999 molar A and 0 0.001 molar C and maybe approximately zero B. So we've consumed B, but have we consumed A? Not really, we haven't really changed the concentration of A. So what we can do then is if we were to plot this, this would become K times the concentration of A raised to the alpha 
times the concentration of B raised to the beta, but A here isn't changing. So if we were to plot this, the concentration of A doesn't really change. And so we can effectively just have an observed rate constant that talks about the actual rate constant and has this concentration of A being one molar raised to the alpha. We don't know the alpha is built in. And the only thing then that would change the rate is the concentration of uh, B. So this basically reduces the rate to depending only on one of our, uh, one of our uh, reactants. And then we can see how it depends on uh, B and we can figure out what beta is depending on if it's first, second, or what have you, what order it is. Um, another method that is more useful if one of the reactants is not very soluble or maybe it's very expensive and we don't want to have a thousand fold excess of it is called the method of initial rates. This is the tack that we took in lab six. If we vary the concentration of one of our reactants, A, leaving the other one alone, uh, the initial rate will change. So for example, we could have rate one that is equal to K times the concentration of A1, whatever that is, raised to the alpha, and our B is not changing. Um, and then we would have rate two that's different, that's equal to K times the concentration of whatever our second condition for A is, raised to the alpha, and our B is unchanged. What we can do then is take the ratio of rate one to rate two, and this will give us K times the concentration of A for experiment one and whatever our constant concentration of B is divided by K times the concentration of A for experiment two times whatever B is. And you can see here, our Ks are gonna cancel, our Bs are gonna cancel. And what this simply gives us is then the concentration of A to the one over the concentration of A2 for our two experiments raised to the alpha. Then we can take the natural log. So the natural log of the ratio of the rates here is equal to alpha times the natural log of the ratio of the concentration of reactant A. And so if we plot the log of the initial rates uh, versus the log of the concentration of uh, reactant A, the slope of that will be the order of the reaction. It might be one, two, three, or so on. So this is another method by which we can determine the uh, order of a reaction. We would repeat this uh, by leaving A constant um, and changing B to get the order of, of B. Um, and then of course, like we did in lab, it's much easier to not just do two points, but to do a, a whole line and we can plot it and get more data, which is more useful in that way. Reactions often take place in a series of unique steps. Putting these steps together for a reaction forms a reaction mechanism. A reaction mechanism must obey the experimental rate law in order to be correct. However, obeying the rate law is not actually enough to guarantee that a proposed mechanism is correct. Uh, so if you propose a mechanism, do the experiment, and the experiment can invalidate your mechanism. It can validate your mechanism as well, but it can't ever prove your mechanism. So this is why this is inherently a challenging field. We can't actually look at these reactions. We can only measure the rates, uh, which is challenging, and then try to figure out what actually is going on that explains this. In general, there are only two types of elementary kinetic steps. There's unimolecular steps and bimolecular steps. Unimolecular processes involve a single molecule reacting, while biomolecular processes involve the collision between two molecules. Um, we already calculated the collisional frequency of molecules, and the molecules are colliding all the time but it's very, very unlikely that a third molecule would collide with two in the exact same time. So we don't really ever see tri-molecular collisions, which it does not mean that we can't have third order reactions. How do we have third order reactions? Well, the rate law, uh, the overall order of the rate law is determined by the rate limiting step 
in a mechanism. In some cases, there are multiple rate limiting steps or the rate limiting step involves an intermediate that's built up off of other things. Um, and this can give us third order processes where you have to have the collision between an intermediate and a molecule, but maybe the intermediate is formed by the collision of two other molecules. So you can have three molecules involved in the rate limiting step without having a three order, uh, three molecules colliding all at the same time. The next goal that will finish us off for today's lecture is to derive what are known as integrated rate laws that actually allow us to determine the concentration of reactants and products with respect to time. Experimental data is often taken and then fit into these pre-set up rate laws to determine the order of a reaction and we'll see why that's important uh, in the slides. We'll start by considering a first order reaction. A first order reaction has the following elementary kinetic step. We've already seen this. We have reactant A being converted into product P. This is a first order reaction, meaning that only one molecule of A is involved in the rate limiting step. We get the integrated rate law by literally integrating the rate law as the name implies. So the rate of this reaction is equal to the negative change in the concentration of reactant A with respect to time. But the rate law also tells us this is equal to K times the concentration of A since it's a first order reaction. So what we need to do is rearrange this, put the A's on one side and the T's on the other, and then we can integrate. So we'll divide by the concentration of A and multiply by DT. Uh, and what this will get us is DA, over A is equal to negative KT. We then integrate this um, to find the integrated rate law. What's the appropriate bounds of integration? Well, the appropriate bounds are simply going to be the initial conditions where we have the initial condition of A, right? Whatever the starting concentration of A is. And that is defined as time zero. Then at some time T, we have whatever our concentration of A is left. This is a pretty easy one to integrate. We've done this a few times. The integral of dx over x is simply the natural log of x. So we have the natural log of the concentration of A evaluated from the concentration of A to the initial concentration of A. And the integral of negative uh, k dt is simply going to be negative k t evaluated from t to zero. So doing this evaluation, we get the natural log of the uh, concentration of A over the initial concentration of A is equal to negative kT. Uh, we can go ahead and rearrange this for the concentration of A. So we'll raise this uh, to E. Um, and that will give us that the concentration of A at any time is equal to the initial concentration of A times E to the minus k. T. First order reactions proceed by exponential decay. We can also figure out how the product P will be formed. We can use the rate of the loss of A to determine the rate of the production P. So in this case, the initial concentration of product A is equal to whatever the actual concentration of A is plus P. If we start with one mole of A, that will either be converted to P or remain as A. So we can rearrange this and say that P is equal to the initial concentration of A minus the concentration of A, and then substitute in this for the concentration of A. So doing that will give us the following. Uh, we'll have that P is equal to A naught minus A naught E to the minus KT. And that's more commonly written as the initial concentration of A times one minus E to the minus KT. And so uh, the, the rate of loss of A will be a simple exponential decay. And then the rate of production of P will also be an exponential decay but it will increase to one instead of decreasing to zero. Um, and so here we have our concentration of A with time and we have the concentration of P with time. It is sometimes convenient to describe the half-life of a process. The half-life is the amount of time it takes for the concentration of the reactant to be halved. The half-life for a first order reaction is simply minus K 
t to the one half. Um, and then we'll have, uh, so I'm taking this definition here. So minus k t to the one half is equal to the natural log of the concentration of A at the half-life, the concentration of A is equal to the initial concentration of A divided by two. And then we divide by the initial concentration of A. This is simply equal to the natural log of one half or the negative natural log of two. We can cancel out the negatives and divide by K to get that the half-life for a first order reaction is equal to the natural log of two divided by the rate constant K. Since there is only one reactant in these first order reactions, the rate is independent of the concentration of reactants. First order reactions depend on the spontaneous reaction of one molecule and not on any sort of collision. So we don't need to take concentration into account. We'll next look at second order reactions. Second order reactions come in two types. We could either have two of the same molecules being involved or two different molecules. Uh, the two of the same molecules is a little bit easier, so we'll start with that. If we have two of the same molecules, our elementary reaction step would be 2A being converted to product P. To find the integrated rate law, we do the exact same thing. Our rate is equal to minus one half times the change of the concentration of A with respect to time. And the rate law is now K times the concentration of A squared. So the rate law we need to integrate then is slightly different. Um, and what we'll do in this rate law is we'll note that if we take this one half and pair it up with this K, we can say that this is equal to dA dt is equal to 2k times the concentration of A squared. And what's commonly done is the 2 is lumped in to that k for what's called an effective rate constant. All the constants are just kind of put together there. Um, and of course, if we want to actually get the rate law, we can take that 2 back out. But often, this is the way it's talked about. And this is the way we'll do the derivative. So the rate then needs to be the integral of this. We can rearrange this. Um, and what we would end up with is as follows. So we'll have a negative integral from uh, A naught to A. And now we have dA over A squared. So we get a different integral. This is still equal to the integral of zero to T of K effective in this case dt. So the integral now of x uh, over or dx over x squared, uh, it's just x to the minus 2. We use a polynomial to do this. So this is going to give us 1 over the concentration of a evaluated from the concentration of uh, a to a naught. And that's going to be again equal to the k effective times t from t to t naught. So this equation simply becomes one over the concentration of A uh, minus one over the concentration of A naught. And that is equal to K effective times T. So we get a very different functional form here. Um, if we wanted to, we could build this up to actually get what the concentration of A is. I'm gonna write it in a kind of a lazy way. And I'll say the concentration of A is equal to one over the concentration of A naught plus K effective times T. And this all needs to be inverted. Uh, and I don't, don't actually want to go through the math of inverting this here. I'll show you a plot of this and we'll see what it looks like. Uh, we can also calculate the half-life of this by doing the same uh, thing that we did above. We simply need to plug in what half the concentration is. So if we want to figure out what the T one half is, that's simply when the concentration of A is equal to half of the concentration uh, of its initially. Um, and so when we do that, we end up with two over A naught minus one over A naught, uh, which is just one over A naught. So that gives us a, a half life of one over the effective rate constant times the concentration of A naught. So this is actually concentration dependent. Um, the more reactant we have, 
uh, the slower the half-life, which makes sense because we have more stuff and they actually have to collide with each other. Uh, now let's go back to the slides here uh, and we'll actually look at what these plots are. Here we can see first order reactions again. Um, and here they're plotted as exponential decays. Here they've been manipulated to be linear. Uh, this is often done because we as humans like seeing lines and it's easier for us to look at the slopes of lines than the extent of exponential decays. I'll bring up the second order reactions next. So the second order reaction um, looks like this. Now, you'll note that this kind of looks a whole lot like an exponential decay. Um, so this is why we really do need to mathematically fit these rate laws. If I were to draw this on the board, uh, this is why I didn't draw it on the board in, in, on this lecture, is you would think that this is an exponential decay function. But it's clearly not the same as an exponential decay function when we look at an actual exponential decay. Uh, in fact, I have them both plotted here on a Desmos graph. Let's bring this up. Um, and you can see that these are actually quite different. So in red, we have our exponential decay and the exponential decay uh, falls and then pretty rapidly hits zero. That's not the case for our second order rate law. The second order rate law actually starts much faster than the exponential decay because we have more collisions and so forth. And then it drops off pretty harshly. So this is a hyperbolic function that looks kind of like an exponential decay, but you can see when it actually is compared to an exponential decay is quite different. However, our eyes are pretty bad at actually recognizing the difference between these two. Uh, and that's why it's really important to actually fit the rate law to both exponential decays and also second order reactions because it can be deceiving, especially to our eyes. And again, remember the balanced chemical reaction has nothing to do with the rate uh, law. We have to, experiment to experimentally determine this every time. I'll lastly here just bring up second order reactions uh, of type two. And these reactions are when we have a, a different reactant. So we have A and B, not just two A's. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the derivation for this. It's not that bad, but it's, it's not that great either. Uh, we could do it. We end up with our equation that looks like this because we have two different things. We have two different initial concentrations of these things. Uh, and the second order rate law uh, looks like this. It has the same sort of pattern as the uh, same type of molecule. So is the 2A going to P, but it's a little bit more complicated because we have differences in A and B. Right, resume in three. So this is all we want to discuss today for sort of the background for rate laws. In the next lecture, we're actually going to apply these rate laws to real chemical scenarios and start considering things like equilibrium, reversible reactions, and so on. And in the final lectures of the semester, we'll go over some more advanced reaction mechanisms.